This is Jiaosu County in the Ili Kazakh Autonomous Prefecture in Xinjiang. Today is the horse race in the Jiaosu Celestial Horse Festival. The riders have been doing their final training since this morning. The three mountain ranges forming two land basins is a typical formation in Xinjiang. The three mountain ranges are the Kunlun Mountains to the south, the Tian Mountains in the middle, and the Altai Mountains to the northeast. The two land basins are the Tarim Basin and the Dzungarian Basin. The Ili region in Xinjiang is surrounded by mountains on three sides, with the Ili River flowing through it. And it is this that gives the region its name. The region boasts land that is fertile and rich in resources, and it has a moderate climate. The vast grasslands here have always been a paradise for nomadic peoples. At the sound of the starting pistol, the horses gallop from the starting gate. The Chinese and foreign riders drive their trusty steeds as quick as lightning across the prairie. As the horses begin racing, the spectators begin looking for vestiges of the divine horse of ancient Chinese mythology. The divine horse, which was said to have infinite stamina, was one of the world's most ancient horse breeds, and it was domesticated more than three millennia ago. Jiaosu has always been one of the most abundant sources of primitive horse breeds in the world, and it's widely recognized as one of the birthplaces of modern world breeds. The ancient Wu Suan state on the Ili grasslands produced an abundance of good horses. Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty initially called them celestial horses. When he later acquired Akal Turka horses, he called them celestial horses and renamed the horses from Wu Suan as Qi Ji horses because they came from Western China. Today's horse ranch in Jiaosu is home to valuable Akal Turka horses as well as fine breeds from other parts of the world. They've been crossbred to produce new Ili breeds, earning Jiaosu the reputation of home to China's best horse. The ideal natural conditions of the Ely grasslands are not only good for the grass, but for the horses as well. And since travelers on the Silk Road had to pass through the area, it's also been the site of military conflict since ancient times. There have been many crises here, hidden in the apparently rich and vast grasslands, as striving for the optimum space for survival has been a constant theme for the tribes living on the grasslands. Driving a car across the Ely grasslands in western Xinjiang with its verdant landscape, one can see many mysterious earth mounds along the road. The smaller mounds are over 100 meters in circumference and 8 meters high, and the larger ones are over 350 meters in circumference and over 20 meters high. 
Some of the many thousands of mounds are arranged in rows of just a few or more than 10. These strange mounds are found all across the grasslands and farms. Archaeological excavation and evaluation have revealed the true nature of these mounds. Many of them are burial sites for members of the ancient state of Usun. According to a description in the Book of Han, the location of the Wusun state largely corresponds to the modern-day drainage basin of the Ili River. Because it was so long ago, most people today consider its existence very mysterious. In fact, Wusun history shows that the cultures of the former Wusun state and the Central Plains have always been linked. Not only were there political and economic disputes between the two, but they also had important historical figures in common. The people of Wusun occupied the drainage basin of the Ili River for about five centuries in the area then known as the Western Region. They should have left many traces of their existence, but in fact, little is known about them. It's natural to wonder how this powerful state could just disappear from history some 2,000 years ago. Wusun had played an important role in the conflict between the Han and the Xiongnu but now seem to have disappeared, leaving hardly a trace. This bronze warrior is a national treasure now in the Ili Kazakh Autonomous Prefecture Museum. It was unearthed in the 1980s from the great grassland in Xinyuan County in Ili. The warrior is naked from the waist up and kneels on his right leg. Archaeologists believe that it was produced by the Scythians, who were the earliest tribe in the Ely River region. Research has shown that the Wusun were one of the largest tribes to emerge after the Scythians. They were a mixture of Scythians and other peoples, so some of their culture and traditions were based on those of the Scythians. And their physical appearance was a combination of characteristics of the Caucasian and Mongolian races. There are about 50 Wusun burial sites near the east bank of the river in Jiaosu County and at least three burial complexes in Nilka County. The majority of these burials are arranged in north-south rows. They mostly consisted of various sized wooden chambers containing burial goods. This painted pottery flask, unearthed in Nilkar County, dates to the early Iron Age. Wusun pottery manufacture first developed as a cottage industry, and by sometime around 1 CE, it became common in the area. This bronze square plate with human faces and animal feet is even more spectacular. It has broad edges and is flat on the bottom, making it similar in shape to a modern tray. It was unearthed in Chubu Cha'ar Shiba Autonomous County in 1983. The ancient herdsmen that lived here hunted on horseback. 
They cooked what they killed, and they ate it from dedicated containers. This square bronze plate was initially believed to have been used for serving meat dishes. The four animal hooves with human faces make it a very unique item. In the 1980s, an ancient copper mine was discovered on the south bank of the Kashgar River in Milkar County. Carbon-14 dating revealed the mine to be approximately 2,500 years old. This led experts to conclude that it was the source of the raw material for artifacts such as the bronze warrior and the square bronze plate. It also shows that the area was rich in mineral resources. The Scythians and the people of Wusun, who subsequently lived on the grasslands, mastered the advanced technologies of mining and smelting over 2,000 years ago, and they had their own unique methods for identifying minerals. Unlike similar objects from Kyrgyzstan, the square bronze plate unearthed from an ancient Wusun tomb was later viewed as not related to food. It's now believed that it was used to hold fire to light the sacrifice in Zoroastrian rites. Zoroastrianism originated in ancient Persia, and sometime in the 4th century BC it entered Xinjiang via Central Asia. The objects of Zoroastrian worship were similar to those of the primitive nature worship of Xinjiang, and thus they were readily accepted by the local population. Zoroastrianism was the earliest non-native religion in the Ely region, and it was first adopted by the Scythians. Archaeological finds show that the Wu Suan people intermarried with Scythians, and they probably adopted their belief in Zoroastrianism. The funerary objects from the burial mounds have begun to inform us about the lives of the ancient Wusun people. According to the Book of Han, the Wusun capital was called Chugulchang, meaning Red Valley City. was built for the new queen inside the Wusun King's main castle. The Chinese called the place around the palace Red Valley City. In other words, it could be that the nomadic people of Wusun established this fixed capital to make Princess Shi Jun feel more at home. In 1988, history professor Su Beihai of Xinjiang University hypothesized that Wu Suan had two capitals. The one on the southern bank of the Turkos River was the summer capital, and the one on the southeastern bank of Isil Kul Lake was the winter capital.
The high salinity of Isikul Lake keeps the water from freezing in winter. The unique local conditions made the area a good site for the nomads to pass the winter. Archaeologists have discovered evidence that the Wusun people once lived here. The weather along the Turkos River, one of the three main tributaries of the Ili River, stays comfortably cool in the summer. In addition to the many Wusun tombs found in the area, many traces of Han culture have also been discovered here. This is another major reason why experts believe this was the summer capital. Relics associated with the Han dynasty, such as mirrors, daggers and other items from the ancient tombs in Turkos County, show that the site was long in close contact with the central plains. Princess Shi Jun was unaccustomed to nomadic life, so she had a palace built for her residence. This palace may well have been east of Wusun, which was closer to Han Dynasty territory. The idea that the king of Wusun would establish a capital to please this first Han princess in this political marriage may seem a little strange. But the policy of peace through marriage did help to keep the peace between the Central Plains and the kingdoms west of China. The states of the Xiongnu, Han Dynasty and Wu Sun formed a triangle. The Xiongnu was in the center and occupied the vast lands northwest of the Great Wall. The western Han and Wu Sun were located east and west of the Xiongnu. The Xiongnu often invaded the territory of the western Han, seriously threatening security in the central plains. To maintain peace on the western frontier and defeat the Xiongnu, Emperor Wu of the Western Han formed political alliances with the smaller states in the western region through marriage. He hoped that the coalition with these small states could counter the Xiongnu oppression. Zhang Qian, a former envoy to the western region, proposed forming an alliance with Wu Sun, the biggest state in the western region. He also proposed sending a Han princess to form a political bond with the Wu Sun and counter the Xiongnu threat. In addition, the Wu Sun territory was an important link between the east and west, so forming a bond with Wu Sun would benefit the Western Han in its western development. According to the biography of Zhang Xian in the Book of Han, when Wu Sun were attacked by the powerful Yuezhi tribe, the king was killed. When the king's youngest son, Liu Jiaomi, escaped, he was fed by a wolf and a crow. So Mordu, king of the Xiongnu, treated him as a divinity. He grew up to be a courageous general for the Xiongnu. Around the year 113 BC, Mordu's successor appointed Liu Jiaomi to lead expeditionary troops to Yuezhi territory around the Ili and Chu rivers. To reward him for his great victory, he gave Liu Jiaomi control of the grazing lands by the Ili River and Isik Kul Lake. On behalf of the Xiongnu, Liu Jiaomi kept a close eye on the states in the western region.
The territory awarded to Liu Jiaomi was located along the middle range of the Tian Mountains and included the land basins defined by the mountains. The area was surrounded by mountains on the north, east, and south. The opening to the west brought in humid breezes, creating an oasis on the Eurasian continent. In addition, it was located on the route of the Silk Road, making it an important center for the exchange of commodities between east and west, and a melting pot of cultures. The Ely grasslands provided the nomads with the natural resources needed for development, and their geographical location was a superior military position. The name Wu Suan implied that the people were a unified ethnic group. When they migrated to the area around the Ely River and Issyk Kul Lake, it opened a new chapter in their development. The Wu Suan people had always admired the Han Dynasty, but they were isolated from the Central Plains by the Xiongnu. The price paid by the Wu Sun for accepting Xiongnu military assistance was suffering under the Xiongnu as overlord. The Wu Sun yearned to break away from Xiongnu control, but they were still too weak militarily to switch their allegiance to the Han. Zhan Qian once again traveled thousands of miles to meet with the Wu Suan king in an attempt to strengthen ties between the Wu Suan and the Han. He wanted to persuade King Liu Jiaomi to form an alliance with the Han court to put the squeeze on the Xiongnu. But Liu Jiaomi was unsure of the strength of the Western Han and was more afraid of the Xiongnu, so he couldn't come to a decision. Frustrated, Zhang Qian suggested that the Wu Sun choose envoys to accompany him on his return to the East so that they could see the strength of the Han dynasty and possibly convince the Wu Sun to join the Han. When the Wu Sun envoys saw the western Han capital of Chang'an, with its high city walls, busy streets and thriving commerce, all signs of a strong and prosperous nation, they were amazed and they were convinced. But news of the Wu Sun's closer ties with the Han soon reached the ears of the Xiongnu. The Xiongnu leaders decided to take military action. King Liu Jiaomi naturally became nervous. He sent an envoy with a thousand Wu Sun horses as a betrothal gift and requested a Han princess for marriage. He hoped that an alliance through marriage would counter Xiongnu aggression. In those days, the horse was a crucial resource in battle. Emperor Wu was very pleased with the horses from the Wu Suan and authorized the royal marriage. In 105 BC, Liu Xijun, a member of the Han court, was chosen by Emperor Wu to be Liu Jiaomi's bride. In an attempt to prevent closer ties with the Han court, the Xiongnu offered one of their own princesses to the Wu Sun king. The king decided to marry both princesses. For the time being, the Wu Sun were able to balance relations between the Han and the Xiongnu.
Just a few months later, two majestic convoys traveled toward the Wusun court, one for the Han princess from Chang'an, and the other for the Xiongnu princess from north of the Gobi Desert. They progressed with great majesty. This novel three-way princess diplomacy between the Han, Xiongnu, and Wu Sun would soon play out on the banks of the Ili River. The Wu Sun king gave the Han princess the title of imperial concubine of the right, and the Xiongnu princess the title of imperial concubine of the left. However, the concubines of the right and the left were not equal. The Wu Suan regarded the left as dominant, which meant that the Han princess Xi Jun was subordinate to the Xiongnu princess. Moreover, Xi Jun was completely unaccustomed to nomadic life. But the marriage was arranged to establish a strategic alliance, so Xi Jun was obliged to shoulder her nation's mission with no consideration of her own happiness. My family sent me off to be married in a faraway land. They sent me to a strange land, to the king of Wu Suan. I live in a domed house with walls of felt, of only meat to eat, and fermented milk to drink. I constantly think of home, and my heart is full of sorrow. I wish I were a yellow swan, returning to my home country. This simple song, called Song of the Yellow Swan, reflects the great loneliness of the princess. Lia Jaume tried everything he could to help the Han princess adjust to life on the grasslands. He even built a special castle for Princess Shi Jun. But before Princess Xi Jun became accustomed to life in Wu Suan, the aged Lia Jiaomi decided to marry her to his grandson, who would later be known as Jun Chumi. Princess Xi Jun viewed this primitive Wu Suan marriage custom as unethical and perverse. She sent a memorial to Han Emperor Wu, requesting that she be able to return to her homeland. The envoy carrying the memorial passed through the desert and the forest as he traveled along the Silk Road. For the anxious Princess Xi Jun, time seemed to almost stand still. The envoy did not bring good news. The reply read, Follow their customs. We want to cooperate with the Wu Suan to annihilate the Xiongnu. The princess was crushed by the emperor's words. Five years after arriving on the grasslands and deep in depression, she died at the tender age of 21. The site of Princess Xi Jun's burial is a mystery. Some scholars believe that her tomb may have been on the southern bank of the Turkos River outside the summer capital. Others point out that the Wu Sun were mainly active around today's Zhao Su County. The ancient Xia Te Road, an important passage connecting areas to the north and south of the Tian Mountains, is in this area. This passage led to her homeland, so the princess may have been buried somewhere along this ancient road. Modern residents of Jiaosu 
have set up a memorial for Princess Xi Jun at the entrance to the ancient Xiaotou Road. A new statue of the princess among the solemn Wusun graves shows her to be a gentle, restrained and intelligent soul whose joys and sorrows alike are now silent. Following the death of Princess Xi Jun, Jun Shumi decided to continue the example of Han Emperor Wu by making peace through marriage. He hoped to both keep the Xiongnu in check and hold on to his new position. Interaction and intermixing between the two nations was inevitable due to the natural geography, their proximity, culture, economics and politics. In the year 101 BC, the entire Han wedding party protected by guards left Chang'an and began their long journey westwards. Emperor Wu personally picked for Jun Shumi, a princess who was totally different in temperament and manners from Shi Jun. Her name was Liu Jieyou. Actually, Jia Yo faced the same situation that had been the fate of Princess Xi Jun. She too was given the title of Imperial Concubine of the Right and was thus subordinate to the Shuknu Imperial Concubine. And like Xi Jun, she had no feelings for her husband and she also missed her homeland. But her cheerful nature and strong spirit enabled her to go through with it. She did it to restore honor to her family. Princess Ji Yo's grandfather, Liu Wu, had been a powerful prince, but died in the rebellion of the seven states, bringing down the entire family. As a result, Princess Jie Yo became a commoner in the streets of Chang'an. In order to rehabilitate her family's reputation, Princess Jie Yo endured the humiliation and ultimately adjusted to life in Wusun State. But several years later, relations between Wu Sun and the Xiongnu became even stronger when the Xiongnu princess had a son for Jun Shumi. Meanwhile, Jie Yo was still childless. But instead of becoming upset, Princess Jie Yo waited patiently for a change in fortune. Then, Jun Shumi died. And this meant that Princess Jie Yo could be remarried. But unlike Princess Shi Jun, who died in misery, Princess Jie Yo accepted everything calmly. Her second marriage had a tremendous effect on the Han, the Xiongnu, and Wu Sun, and it even affected the entire Western region. Princess Jie Yo's new husband was Wang Guimi, a cousin of her first husband. Historical records indicate that he was an accomplished politician who greatly admired the culture of the Han. This helped strengthen relations between the Han and Wu Suan, with messengers constantly traveling between the two states. Meanwhile, Contact between the Han Dynasty and other states in the western region became more frequent. The Silk Road prospered 
as the states of the western region vied to improve contact with the Han. Gradually, silk became common among well-off Wusun citizens. As part of the dowry for the marriage alliance, farmers and skilled workers accompanied the princess to Wusun, bringing grain cultivation to Red Valley City. Princess Ji Yo and Wang Gui Mi had three sons and two daughters together, and all of them became highly influential in Wusun history. Through her assistance and influence, Ji Yo played a very significant role in stabilizing Wusun and improving relations with the Han. Wang Gui Mi resolutely turned away from the old policy by pledging allegiance to the Han. When Wang Guimi sided with the Han, the Xiongnu immediately reacted. In 74 BC, a huge Xiongnu army marched straight into the Wusun interior. In a show of strength, they also sent a special envoy to Xu Guzheng, demanding that Wang Guimi hand over Princess Jie Yo and cut off all contact with the Han as the price for withdrawing their troops. The threat of the Xiongnu aroused the ire of those that favoured rapprochement with the Xiongnu. They advocated handing over Princess Jie Yo. The city was in an uproar, with some calling for war and others calling for surrender. Initially, Wang Guimi was also undecided. In the daytime, Princess Jie Yo persuaded Wang Guimi not to aggravate the situation and at night, she wrote to the Han court requesting assistance. If she could get the emperor to send troops, the crisis would be resolved. But the Han court was dealing with its own issues. Following the death of Han Emperor Zhao, the powerful minister Huo Guang had the new emperor deposed. The ministers were much more concerned about who would become emperor than some crisis in faraway Wu Sun. Princess Jie Yo had to save herself. She convinced some members of the Wusun royal family to be on her side and prepared for war. In the end, fierce resistance prevented the Xiongnu from gaining entry to the Ili River Valley, strengthening the morale of both the troops and the civilians. After Emperor Xuan ascended the throne, Princess Jie Yo and Wang Guimi again sent a petition to the Han Emperor. They urged him to help the Wusun by attacking the Xiongnu on the east and west sides, reminding him of the alliance forged through marriage. The Xiongnu were also taking rapid military action to maintain their rule of the western region. Based in the Balikun grasslands, they attacked Wusun in an attempt to gain control of the region north of the Tian Mountains and cut off communications between Wusun and Han. In 71 BC, the Han court sent a huge army to suppress the Xiongnu. Wang Wei Mi personally fought in this battle, 
and Han envoy Chang Hui followed the Han troops into battle. The Wusun troops directly attacked the royal court of the Xiongnu. The Han Wusun alliance was victorious, greatly reducing the power of the Xiongnu in the western region. But the Xiongnu were not totally defeated. In the last months of the year, they launched a surprise attack on the Wu Suan. But the attack turned out to be a mistake. On their way back, they encountered the heaviest snow in a century and suffered a bitter defeat. In late 70 BC, heavy snow covered the entire territory of the Xiongnu dooming countless civilians and livestock to death by freezing. Some small tribes north of the desert took advantage of the situation to launch a joint attack with Wu Sun against the Xiongnu, handing them a crushing defeat. In 60 BC, after Xiongnu surrendered, the Han government established a protectorate in the western region, essentially incorporating it into Han territory. The Wusun captured a large number of Xiongnu troops and overnight became the most powerful state in the western region. In 61 BC, Wang Guimi sent a memorial to the Han court asking that Yuan Guimi, the eldest son of Princess Jie Yo, be named his heir. He also asked that a Han princess marry his son to strengthen relations with Wu Suan. Princess Jie Yo's niece was selected as the new Han princess to participate in a political marriage. But just as the marriage party was arriving at Dunhuang, Wang Guimi suddenly died, and with his death, the ten-year dominance of the Wusun in the western region came to an end. The Han Wusun marriage alliance was also cancelled. Princess Jie Yo once again faced trouble on all sides. Wang Guimi's half-brother Ni Mi, whose mother was a Xiongnu princess, took advantage of the situation to remove Princess Jie Yo's eldest son from the throne and seize power. He followed a policy that favoured the Xiongnu over the Han, and he demanded that Princess Jie Yo marry him. Princess Jie Yo accepted Nimi's betrothal gifts, but secretly plotted his death. Unfortunately, her plan failed, and Nimi escaped. She immediately had Nimi's trusted followers executed, and then strengthened defense measures in anticipation of Nimi's revenge. But Nimi was now too afraid to act. In 53 BC, Wu Jiotu killed Nimi. The Han court then named Wu Jiotu as king and Yuan Guimi as great king. In 51 BC, Emperor Xuan allowed Princess Jie Yo to return to Chang'an. Because of the great contributions she made to her nation, the Emperor received this great Han princess, who was then nearly 70 years old, with great ceremony. Princess Jie Yo died in Chang'an two years later. Following the death of Princess Jie Yo, the state of Wu Sun began breaking apart. In 437, Wu Sun was recorded joining the mission of the 16 kingdoms of the western region to pay tribute to the Northern Wei court. But this is the last record of Wu Sun in history. Wu Sun was then a small state hiding in the mountains that soon after disappeared completely. 
and to this date, no one knows for sure why it disappeared. In the mid-15th century, a group of nomadic tribes formerly part of the Golden Horde became known as the Kazakhs, meaning refugees or escapees. Some also say that Kazakh meant white swan or freedom fighter. Experts generally believe that the Wusun were one of the original ethnic groups in the Kazakhs. <laughs> The Kazakhs call their felt tents yurts. They're easily transported, durable and comfortable. Kazakh nomads have favoured yurts for their home for many centuries. The yurts are made almost entirely from local materials. The frame is red willow from the desert. The outside cover is woven needle grass secured with rope made from cowhide and tendons. It's light, yet sturdy. The door and frame are made of pine. Finally, a large number of woolen rugs and woolen ropes are used to complete the yurt without a single nail or wedge in the entire structure. The woolen rugs used in the yurt are all made by industrious and intelligent Kazakh women. The first step in making a rug is to prepare the wool by beating with a wooden club, soaking in water, laying out flat to dry, and compacting and tightly rolling and unrolling several times. Since the rugs used in the yurts are white, people call them white palaces. The yurt was an important creation of their Kazakh forefathers. As it says in the song, all things must pass, and no civilization exists in isolation. Every path eventually leads to the same goal, alliance and rivalry among the Han, Wusun and Xiongnu civilizations, and the individual efforts of various heroic figures, were all part of the historical process of civilizations constantly breaking down barriers through communication, and eventually joining together. Even more significant is that all choices and efforts must follow the general trend of history. No matter how perilous the process, people will always strive for a simple life and pure relationships. golden mask and a stone statue loom high over the grasslands. The Turkic people succeeded the Xiongnu to dominate the grassland empire. Meanwhile, the Tang empire was slowly rising in the east. The clash of the two was inevitable. Join us for part two of On the Banks of the Ely River. <laughs>